Loving Without Boundaries, inspiring interviews, actionable advice, and discussions about the challenges and the joys of ethical non-monogamy. And now your host, Kitty Shambliss. Thanks for joining us for part two of an interview with Rye from a Rye perspective. Right now, we're talking about different communication styles with our partners. Let's join the conversation. You taught me the terms open awareness and open approval, and I've kind of adopted that. And that's just in terms of how you structure um, both your privacy and the amount of transparency and openness. And, and, and consent, too. Yeah, and consent, yeah. And for me, I personally, there's nothing wrong with don't ask, don't tell in theory. For me personally, I don't prefer that style, uh, b- partly because to me it just circles the drain of cheating just a little too closely. Um, and I think that sometimes people can take advantage of the don't ask, don't tell. Um, and it's just, it's just... I don't know. I just, for me personally, it doesn't work. But when you help me with understand the concepts of open approval and open awareness, um, that really helped me. So Let, let's get into those terms for a yeah. minute because I think I coined them. Maybe mm-hmm. not. I think I, it was you. <laughs> I, I certainly didn't coin the concept, but uh, putting those words to it. So basically, you know, um, some people, some polydynamics want veto power and the ability to approve new partners in advance. For example, let's say you've got two partners that are together and one of them wants to bring in a third on his own. Mm -hmm. And so the other partner wants to meet up face to face, shake hands, make sure everything is kosher and then move forward. I can't do that. I want to be able to act in the moment. I want to have some spontaneity in my life. And so if I go out and I meet someone and I want to connect with them, I do it. And then... As part of the awareness aspect of it, I inform my partners of it as soon as it's convenient, typically during the first 20 minutes of our next date. Mm. That's, that's our rule, is that before we have sex again, we inform each other of whatever is necessary that's happened since the last time we saw each other. So that's, that's an awareness thing. Where it's like, I'm doing this thing, I've done this thing, and I'm letting you know that it happened. Mm. It's not a secret. It's not, it's not anything that I'm ashamed of or hiding. It's just what happened, and uh, hopefully you accept me, mm-hmm. which uh, consent in this situation is pre-approved. The other model is approval, where each action needs to be approved in advance. Mm-hmm. So it's the difference of when are you informing your partner? Is it in advance or after the fact? I personally prefer to do after the fact. Mm-hmm. But sometimes... Just to make things easier, just to make things a little easier to swallow, we'll, we'll mention, hey, this might happen. Just letting you know. That doesn't mean that the partners all need to meet and deal with each other just yet. Right. Typically, I'll date someone for months before I introduce them to my other partners. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think timing is critical. But I found um, coming up with all these different terms, I actually find really helpful just because it gives you... A toolkit, if you will, like a vocabulary toolkit in order to have the conversation. Because before I learned all of this, you know, if when you don't have that vocabulary or that, you know, tool belt to have a, a tough conversation sometimes, you know, it, it just becomes um, difficult to talk about. So I really appreciated those, those terms. For me, the way that our relationships work, we generally speaking have the open, um, open awareness model where, because for me, partly why I'm polyamorous and I think my partners are too, is I highly value freedom. Yeah. And I highly value the thrill of adventure of just being alive and meeting people and the connections that you make with people. And it's hard to enjoy that if you feel, you know, constrained or like you said, caged. Um, So we more subscribe to the open awareness where um, you're free to conduct your life as long as you're practicing safe sex and being responsible and ethical. And if something happens, then I just want to know pretty shortly thereafter. Um, so that's our general rule. But in the end, the way I personally end up practicing is more open approval. And that's partly, um, it's not 
like I, I'm allowed to have the open awareness model, but I end up like in practice doing open approval. But what the, the reason really is because it's almost out of respect and also wanting to protect the smoothness of the relationship. So I find that the more transparent I am, um, the more I'm just talking about what's going on, it just makes everything smoother so that people aren't shocked. So even though I'm, you know, quote unquote, allowed to do what I want, um, the open approval just for me just makes things um, smoother and more respectful. But I think it's it's just great having this vocabulary to be able to to talk about it. Um, so well, that's how it works for me. One thing I love about the the open awareness model is that when when you get caught up in a moment, that doesn't count as cheating because you've already agreed that a moment may happen mm-hmm. and that you both say, well, you know, you might get caught, you know, carried away, and that's okay. I understand. I get carried away too sometimes. Mm. Just tell me about it. Right. And then you can, you, can, you can see how, as time goes on, you and I are both doing something similar where even though the rules say that this is allowed, um, but we end up to err on the side of respect and advance mm. notice. Right. That's really what it comes down to. Respect and advance notice. You've, yeah. you've got a difference here between descriptive versus prescriptive. You know, like the rule of you must tell me what's going to happen before it happens. It's very crystal ball like where you can predict the future and know exactly what's going to happen and, you, you know, predict your own behavior. If I get drunk, I really can't predict my behavior very well. <laughs> Literally, my inhibitions are lowered. Yeah, yeah. So, so I can't always predict my behavior every moment. And sometimes I'll sit down with my partner and, and maybe she's feeling a little edgy and will make specific rules about my body. Like during this last birthday party, um, I currently have three girlfriends, uh, a, a relationship that's in the works, and then some, some partners that have participated in some threesomes and other situations like that, mm. or some casual sex. And so there's... There, there was six or seven potential women that I could have been having sex with that night, plus the possibility of a random hookup on my birthday while I'm drunk. <laughs> right. Very highly. Yeah. Strangely enough, I didn't have sex with anybody that night. <laughs> funny, I was, funny how that works. I was having too much fun just celebrating yeah. with everybody. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I had a long conversation with one of my partners, and she was just uncomfortable with the amount of possibilities and chaos that the night presented. Mm-hmm. And so we made specific rules depending on how close somebody was to me and what part of my body. Like, for example, one of the rules was, I could kiss anybody, but maybe I shouldn't make out for a half an hour with anybody. <laughs> That's funny. Except for my girlfriends, because, yeah. you know, I'm already so close with them, and they're already so in the fold, yeah. that if I have sex with one of them, hey, that's their right, too, because we're all kind of in the same boat here. Yeah. So it was like, depending on the closeness of the girl, and then depending on what part of my body, my lips versus my cock, you know, like, how far is it going to go? <laughs> that's awesome. So it's, you know, you can compromise for the night. Yeah. Well, and I think some of it is built on, uh, when I talked about this on my blog, uh, some of the readers um, started to say, well, maybe you don't, as time goes on and you build trust and you build respect, sometimes you don't need all these rules. Then you just also just start to get to know your partner. You trust that they're going to do the right thing. You trust that they're going to be transparent about it. And I thought that was interesting too. Like it's in- it's good and helpful sometimes to have the labels or to have a framework. But I also find that as time goes on, you also just kind of get into a fluid, I don't know, movement with your partners where you just, the amount of trust and respect between you just kind of is enough of this solve or the band-aid to, to make it all flow. Sometimes yeah. I, I see relationships go in various directions at various times where sometimes as time goes on, you get less rules. Other relationships get more rules. Yeah. Uh, I, in my relationships, it tends to be a bit of a roller coaster mm-hmm. where during uh, less secure moments, there'll be more reservations. And during very secure moments, there'll be almost no rules. And personally, as a uh, lover of women of all types and sizes and colors, I can't really be trusted all the time to slow my roll. Like, I've Mm got to be sometimes slowed 
by an external source. Right, right. If I was single and if there were no rules or expectations on me mm -hmm. and doing a don't ask, don't tell and nobody had no idea what I was doing, mm -hmm. I'd be fucking a lot more girls <laughs> than I already am uh -huh. because I have an insatiable appetite and I'm a borderline sex addict. I'm a recovered, <laughs> recovering sex addict. Mm -hmm. So I have a love of women and... and uh, I can't necessarily be trusted without some expectations of understanding the consequences of my behavior. Right. I'm very aware, and partly I'm very aware because I communicate a lot with my partners mm -hmm. of what's too much, what's intolerable, what's going too far. Right. People can't deal with everything. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody has their limits. Now, I think that's interesting, an interesting point you brought up because we've had that kind of experience in our relationships, particularly with my boyfriend and I, in terms of expectations. And one thing I want to touch on is coming out. Yeah. When I get all, you know, there's a lot of questions that you get over and over again when, when coming out. And um, a lot of times I have to be careful about how I'm explaining my relationship structure and my choices because I think a lot of people jump to conclusions that um, certainly open relationships are swinging, but then they overlap it with polyamory where they think there are no rules. It's just a free for all. Everybody's having sex with everybody else. Everyone gets to eat their, have their cake and eat it too. And, you know, it's, and touching on what you were just saying, that's really not the case, it, particularly with polyamory, I think, where there, I don't like to use the word rules because that feels restrictive, but I like to talk about the, you know, agreements and, and like you said, consent. Um, so, you know, in terms of, you know, how far is too far and, and sometimes you need external people to pull you back in. Um, to me, that, that touches on just in terms of, you know, there, there are guidelines and, you know, uh, being concerned about your partner's feelings that, that really is partly what polyamory is all about. Multiple loving relationships is about taking care of first yourself within all those different relationships. And some of that is about um, sometimes you need to adjust your behavior or at the very least um, have lots of communication about what's going on, you know? Yeah. In, in your circles, and maybe we can, you know, cross this over with the coming out conversation. Do you find a lot of discrimination in terms of your behavior or, or explaining that you're polyamorous to people or that you have all these different girlfriends? And I thought we'd touch on um, some of the terms you and I talked about, about microaggression and some of those things. Discrimination is such a broad term. It can be overt or it can be very, very subtle in, in much the same way that there can be discrimination, you know, regarding feminism and sexism, discrimination regarding gender, race, ethnicity, religion. These things aren't necessarily, oh, you're polyamorous, you're fired. <laughs> like, it's not quite that simple. Yeah. Say, let's let's talk about work for a minute and the stigma and the microaggression that can be taking place in the office in the work party, in the business dinner. For example, you might have a business dinner where everyone is granted a plus one for this business dinner. They're not granted a plus two. Right. And if I show up with a plus two, and I decide, okay, well, boss is paying for me and my plus one, and I will take on the burden and pay for my own plus two, I'll still get real weird looks at that business dinner. Everyone will be like, we only brought one. Why do you have to bring two? And really, I could bring a plus three or a plus four. Right. And now I have to choose one of them for my plus one. Mm -hmm. And do I choose the partner that I've been with for three years or the one that I've been with with one year? And then if I show up with different partners to each business dinner, mm -hmm. now the whole table goes, oh, what happened to the last girl? Where's she? Right. I'm like, oh, I'm still with her. Well, why isn't she here? And why is this new girl replaced her? Mm -hmm. Well, she's not new. I've been with her for a year. That situation just shows the privilege of being monogamous, mm -hmm. where monogamy is the norm, and we are not. Right. Anything right. that's not. A plus mm -hmm. one. And that even goes for couple privilege, too. What about the people that are single? They come with a, with a plus zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think it's interesting, especially because uh, just yesterday, the, um, they just passed the rule on the Supreme Court about gay marriage. And so I think it's absolutely wonderful um, that that's a form of an alternative lifestyle and a, and a sexual orientation that is now, uh, like it or not, becoming more accepted. But we were just talking, you and I, yesterday about, you know, so we wonder, for example, like plural marriage advocates and, and that type of concept, how long is it going to take for that to get more accepted? And, 
even in my own life when I have a, a, f a few gay friends that are married and they only recently got married and I was reluctant to tell them about my polyamorous nature because I assumed and probably am correct that they were partly getting married whether it was you know to a same sex or not because they were monogamous and I also didn't want to rain on their parade at their wedding you know to you know throw this this in the middle of the room I wanted the focus to be on them but you know you just the polyamory is still outside of the outside you know so I definitely find um, discrimination for me and I thought it was great when you taught me the term microaggression because one way that that's come up for me in my life is uh, my husband and I spent a couple of years actually really taking the time to come out to all of our close friends and family and try and explain how it works for us and I think it works a little differently for you but for us it's almost a form of um, family building, you know, um, like a poly family or a polycule sometimes. It, we, we actually can't have our own children. So for us, it, it becomes like this kind of family environment. And my, my boyfriend does live here at our house. So um, I just like they have their children, you know, our family just looks a little different than yours, like a modern family, like the, the show says. Um, and one way that I've kind of had a microaggression in my life um, that I didn't know how to feel about, so I, I loved the term, was instead of sending, for example, Christmas cards um, that are labeled to all of us every once in a while from these people that we've come out to, we'll get Christmas cards that are still just labeled to my husband and I, and I think the reason most likely is that people are just simply more comfortable that way. They're just more comfortable talking about, you know, a you know, monogamous, you know, um, whether it's man versus woman or a man versus man, they're just more comfortable just talking about two people and it's just not that easy to wrap your head around for other people um, that the, a family can look very different from that. And But I, for me, um, probably because I took so much time and care to come out, um, to me that feels like what you would describe as a microaggression. And, you know, and I have to, I've just learned to accept it and and also there's a lot of forgiveness, I think, that comes along with that. You just have to forgive people for being human in a, in a heteronormative monogamous world. They're just being human, you know? I know advocates against gay marriage who are gay. And one of the reasons they advocate against it is because marriage itself is inherently heteronormative. It is the mainstream accepted tradition. And a lot of gay relationships over the last 50, 60, 100 years have broken from tradition. They do their own thing, which looks sometimes like polyamory. Sometimes it looks like swinging. Sometimes it looks like something with no label. And what's happened is, is that in order to be accepted by the heteronormative community, they've needed to emulate that. And getting this big accomplishment of being able to be married and monogamous and a normal couple is a huge achievement for the gay movement. But some of them see it as a step backward. Why can't they be just accepted for who they are rather than fit into this heteronormative, marriage-minded, traditional mold? Mm -hmm. We're going to deal with this in the next 20 years as we battle with, well, should all of us polyamorous people get into group marriages, plural marriages, V marriages. You know, if you've got a man and a woman and a man, and the two men are not in a real sexual romantic relationship with each other, do they just marry the woman? Or do the men marry each other as mm -hmm. well? Mm -hmm. And especially now that gay marriage is legal, these two men could now right. marry. That's interesting. They yeah. couldn't marry mm -hmm. before. Yeah. So that V marriage is completely undefined. Mm -hmm. There are some polyamorous people that are all involved. I, I know of one quad relationship in particular where all four people are involved. Two of them are married. I can't remember if the other two are married, but th there was a heterosexual marriage, but the four of them are all involved. So you've got a square with an X in the middle. Mm -hmm. So the two men, the two women, the man and the woman, the man and the woman, and the other man and the woman, all involved. And now that you can marry homosexually, they could potentially all marry mm -hmm. each other. But th it's so undefined. You know, the polycule marriage is, is an mm -hmm. unknown term at this point. Mm -hmm. My personal solution in the near term, you know, in 20 years, we'll figure it out. But in the near term, mm -hmm. if you need the best tax benefits 
And the best structure I can think of is an LLC corporation. Right, and I have heard about people doing that. Yeah. Form a corporation. Yeah. You need all those mm-hmm. benefits. You need to define these things, put it in legal terms, You know, be able to grant yourself and each other visitation rights in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Give that power. You can even give power of attorney to mm-hmm. each other, just like a spouse would have. Right, right. Yeah, that is at least one way to work around it until the rest of the world figures it out. <laughs> or doesn't figure it out. I guess time will tell. We'll see what happens. There's the right wing anti-gay marriage saying that, well, once you grant the right of changing one man and one woman to one man and one man, what's stopping it from being three men? Mm -hmm. And their logic is pure and correct. There's nothing stopping it. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. We're going to have three man marriage. We're going to have three women. We're going to have two man and a woman. It's it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And to some respects, I mean, not counting the legal and health benefits of it. I mean, there's a part of me that's just like, whatever, we, you know, we don't necessarily need to solve it. I'm just happy to live my life. Just let me live my life, you know. Which brings me to another phrase that we were talking about, about the um, invisible minority. I thought that was a great term that I never heard of. Again, like I find the vocabulary really helpful. Can you talk about that a little bit? This culture is so good at inventing and coining terms. You know, we're, we're such at a loss yeah. for words that we have to make up our own mm-hmm. and our own phrases. Yeah. Invisible minority, unlike skin color, it's unlike gender. You can basically tell when someone is presenting as a woman or when someone is black, but you cannot inherently tell that someone is gay without a flag or something like that. And you can't tell that I'm polyamorous just by looking at me. Maybe if I'm wearing a t-shirt that says, (laughs) I am polyamorous. Right. Otherwise, my relationship style is completely invisible. You have no idea until you ask me or I tell you. Mm -hmm. And even if you see uh, two women one on each arm, you don't really know what's going on there. Maybe the three of us are single Mm -hmm. and still identify as monogamous people. We just happen to be having a threesome that night. Mm -hmm. It's it's completely invisible, which means that our story is invisible. It means that we can't recognize each other on the street. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're walking by each other on a sidewalk, a woman sees a woman and there is a shared experience inherently. You can go join a, a women's group or you can just see it. Uh, mm-hmm. but you cannot see us. Right. Yeah, and I think that's true with a, a lot of things. And we were talking about how that really becomes a stigma. Like the things that people don't understand or that people don't want to talk about, or in this case, people can't see, um, there's some discrimination because it, it becomes stigmatized. Stigma is from a perception of rarity. Mm-hmm. If you ask the average monogamous married person how many of us exist, they will minimalize us. They will assume that we are the extreme, rare minority. If you ask each other how many of us exist, unless you're an activist and participating in a community, you don't realize just how many of us there are. There are millions and millions and millions of us. And I wish, you know, I I get the question often, if you could be, if you would have known one thing in advance before you started down this path, Mm -hmm. what would it be? I wish someone had told me, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are millions of you. There are so many books that know what they're doing and can show you the path. You don't have to cut it yourself because there's lots of us and it's in your hometown, it's in your backyard, it's in your high school, Mm -hmm. it's at your college. We're everywhere. You just don't see us because we're invisible. Right. Well, that brings me to uh, some of my final questions, one of which is, if you had any advice for anyone considering an alternate lifestyle, particularly along the lines of ethical non-monogamy, polyamory, open relationships, what would that be? Number one, read these two books, Ethical Slut and Opening Up. If you're in a relationship already, start with Opening Up. If you're not currently in a relationship, start with Ethical Slut. Once you've read those two books, I recommend Seeking Community. Uh, There are all kinds of alternative websites. You can Google your hometown and the word poly or polyamorous. You can go to FetLife and look for forums and events. You can even go on Facebook, and if you search for these terms, you'll find groups, secret groups, discussion groups, talking about what's going on in your local town. And I guarantee you it's there. Like, you think it's not, but it is. Mm -hmm. You're not alone on this. Just like, you know, if you were gay, you'd have to seek out the gay bar. It's the Mm -hmm. same thing. Yeah. And then, and then if, if you want to do it more in person, if, if the internet feels funky to you, 
I recommend starting with subcultures that are already celebrating this movement, including Burning Man subculture, the goth groups, a lot of fetish and BDSM people are very into all this. Once you're delving into the alternative lifestyles, even among the gay audience, you know, if you go to a gay bar, start asking around, hey, have you heard of any polyamorous communities or poly parties or, Mm -hmm. you know, where I can find some people like me? Just ask around. But you're probably not going to find that at the uh, PTA meeting. (laughs) Right. Even though a good percentage of that room identifies as you, they're so stigmatized, they're not going to talk about it and they're not going to admit it necessarily. Mm Mm-hmm. That's great advice, and I, I wish I had the same advice, and eventually I kind of did, because that's how we met, was through FetLife forums, so um, thank God we've all got those internets now. Um, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with everyone? I'd like to honor and recognize and approve of your jealousies. There's a lot of people that say, I'm not a jealous person, that's why I practice polyamory. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, the reality is a lot of people that practice monogamy are very jealous people. And a lot of them are not. And it's irrelevant as far as labeling yourself that. And jealousy is just some form of pain, some form of insecurity, something you're worried about. And it's okay. Mm -hmm. And talking about it really helps you work through it. When I do my discussion groups, inevitably, I mean, they are Q&A format, so it's guaranteed Somebody in the audience will ask, how do you deal with jealousy? Well, one way that I deal with it is a communication ritual. And with all of my partners, even at the casual ones, when we get together, the first thing we do is we sit down and talk. We don't immediately press play on a movie or immediately run out the door to a concert. We talk for about 20 minutes. And that's my communication ritual is that initial 20 minutes, this is the time to spill your guts and talk about what's stressing you or what's worrying you or what's making you jealous. This is the time to talk about it and see if you can work through it. And that communication ritual is your solution. That's the best solution to dealing with your jealousies and your partner's Mm. jealousies. That's great advice. And while you were talking, you made me think in terms of the word spectrum, I would describe that there's, we all have a different spectrum of jealousy. I think there are definitely people out there whether it's physiological or emotional, that have almost no jealousy at all. And then there's the opposite of people that have a ton of jealousy and a ton of insecurities, and there's everything in between. And so I think that's something to keep in mind to respect the fact that we're all at a different place on the jealousy spectrum. And also I think you know where you are on the spectrum can change over the course of your yeah. life. Hopefully getting less and less insecure as you get older, you know, it you can, hope. It can change over the course of your month too. That's true, that's true. I mean, we all have bad days and we all tend to be a little bit more insecure. Um, and or, pe- people make mistakes too. You know, you're going true. along so well, it's been three years of great somebody just makes a mistake or is just not thinking straight or oops i didn't realize oh no and and now you know you've got to both deal with that and recover from that mistake no that's very true i think you know another thing to, to think about in terms of handling jealousy and multiple relationships is just the idea of forgiveness you know we're all going to make mistakes and and then you couple that with you know then you have to heal from the mistake whether you're healing your trust or something along those lines but you know, it's really about, at the end of the day, it's about mutual respect, respecting your partners, respecting their feelings, and working through things together, which comes back to communication. And I, I think your communication ritual is great advice for everybody. That's awesome. Yeah, that was a huge stumbling block in the beginning for me is that I knew there was something that needed to be communicated, but there was no established timing for that. And so when things are going well, the tendency is to shut up because you want to enjoy the goodness that's happening. And when things are hitting the fan, this is the worst time to communicate <laughs> right. the difficult thing. Yeah. So with the communication ritual, there's no pins and needles because this is absolutely normal that every time you sit down, every time you go on a date, you're going to have that moment. This is the time to talk. Mm-hmm. And then once it's over... You both can relax. You're like, huh, huh, we're through the worst of it. You know, now we can have six hours of fun instead of six hours of, is there something that he's not saying? Or is, oh, there's something in the back of my mind waiting to be said? Yeah. And then when it's time to fuck, you're so ready. <laughs> Because you know there's no hesitancies anymore. You don't have to go in getting naked going, there's something he's not telling me. (laughs) That's awesome. 
Yeah, I love that. Well, Ryan, this has been awesome. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to um, do this interview with me and have this conversation. I thought it was really great. And I also want to thank you for being my friend. It's been a great friendship, and I'm happy to have you here in D.C. with me and enjoying the just enjoying getting to know you better and getting to um, have this time together. So you've had some great insights. So thanks for sharing them with my community. Thank you, and, and thanks for inspiring me to get off my butt and do more of this. You know? I'm, <laughs> I'm doing so much in L.A. on a local level, but I'm inspired to do something more on an international, global internet level as, as we go on here. And, and, and also, thanks for giving me the opportunity to opine like this. Right. And this is truly just our opinions. That's the beautiful thing mm -hmm. about polyamory is that we're all writing the book of rules and expectations ourselves. Once you break from the tradition, now it's all up to you. This is your journey. And you can follow what I have to say and my other opinions about all this stuff under A Rye Perspective. That's spelled W R Y. And I'm I'm on all social media as A Rye Perspective. YouTube, Fat Life, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name it, it's all A Rye Perspective, including a ryeperspective.com. Thanks for having me. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Rye. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to visit the website, resources, and blog, lovingwithoutboundaries.com, sign up for the email list, and subscribe in iTunes and Stitcher. Go forth and love. We'll talk to you soon.